What we're going to do this week and over the next three weeks, so four weeks worth, of looking at four different key moral theories. And you'll see, as we look at each one, that what you've looked at over the last two weeks is going to come up again and again in different contexts. So you'll be applying what you've looked at very quickly. Now, I'm not going to say you're going to weigh, go away understanding it all after the four weeks, because of course you're not. You've got to do some work yourself. Um, but I, I do want to reassure Sure you that it is going to come up again and again, so you'll find. So, okay, um, I've had one question about that. Anyone else have a, a relatively quick, or a, actually very quick, question on any of these things from last week? Or shall we move straight on? Good, you've had your chance, right? Let's move on. Okay, so um, I've just said that. The four moral theories we're going to look at, um, Aristotle's virtue ethics, or rather virtue ethics, which is derived from Aristotle's moral theory. We're going to look at non-cognitivism, which is derived from Hume's moral theory, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher. We'll look at deontology, which is uh, derived from Kantian philosophy. And finally, we'll look at utilitarianism. Uh, and we'll look at that in the context of John Stuart Mill, although he is only one of many utilitarians. OK, so this week we're looking at virtue ethics, and we're going to be doing all these things. So I'll let you just read that quickly. So virtue ethics is derived from Aristotle's ethics. Um, outlined by him in the Nicomachean Ethics. He also wrote another book on ethics, but, but this is the one we're going to be looking at um, mostly. And he dedicated this book to his son, Nicomachus. Um, so this is a father talking to his son about what he understands morality to be. Um, virtue ethics tells us that the right action is that which would be chosen by a virtuous person. OK, what do you think of that then? Does that mean circular, sir? <laughs> OK. It looks like a risk. Yeah. It looks like what? A risk of being circular. Uh, a risk of being circular. OK, anyone? Uh, Any other comments? People can obviously have different views. Equally, uh, um, that's certainly true. Knowledgeable people can have quite opposite views. OK, so there might be different virtuous people with different yeah, views, yes, you think? But uh, all virtuous okay. people won't, won't follow the line, as it were. Right, OK. Well, I agree that it might not seem very helpful. And right at, right at the end, I'm going to consider whether the fact that uh, it doesn't give us an obvious decision procedure, in other words, this is a theory that when you look at an action, you can say to yourself, what would virtue ethics say about this? And you think, well, OK, it would say that I should do it if a virtuous person would do it and not if a virtuous person wouldn't do it. How helpful is that? Um, we're going to look at whether that's a black mark for it or not. OK, but we'll come back to that. First, we've got to understand what virtue ethics is. OK, Aristotle held a teleological view of nature. And that sort of view is a view according to which everything has a final cause or a goal or an end or a purpose. So um, if... I do something and you explain what I do by appeal to a purpose I have in doing it. Why did she pretend to trip over the carpet? Answer, she wanted to make everyone laugh. My wanting to make everyone laugh is the purpose I had in mind in performing that action. And that's an explanation, isn't it, of, of the action. So that's a, it's a teleological explanation. It's an explanation by appeal to ends. And Aristotle um, was very keen on teleological explanation. Uh, and he believed that everything that exists has an end or purpose. So let's have a closer look at this. To know the final cause or the purpose of a thing is to know what it is to be a good one of its kind. OK, so what's the purpose of a chair? It's for sitting on. OK, a chair that you can't sit on is not a good chair, is it? And how do we know it's not a good chair? Because it doesn't fulfill its purpose. Or what's that horrible phrase they use these days? It's not fit for purpose or something. OK, so um, one thing you know when you know the final cause is to know what it is to be a good thing of that kind. 
Okay? And secondly, to know what is good for that thing is to know what it needs. Sorry, I got the wrong emphasis there. But uh, anything that it needs to fulfill its purpose, for example, what does a chair need in order to be good for sitting on? Well, it probably needs four legs or, or um, something like that. Uh, possibly three, yes. You can sit on a three-legged chair, can't you? But, uh, and, and actually, if it was one very big one, but, but you can see how we're working this out, can't you? Given the purpose of a chair, you can work out what a chair needs to be good for that purpose, and you can work out what, what, it is, what a good chair is. So, and here's another example. To believe that a thing's a plant and that it's the function of a plant to grow is to know the good plant is a plant that grows successfully and anything that facilitates successful growth is, for plants, good. OK? So th that's what it is to have a teleological view of different kinds of thing. So Aristotle believed that human beings, too, have a final cause or a purpose. Um, so a good, or as he put it, excellent human being is one that successfully fulfills that purpose. And anything that facilitates the successful attainment of the purpose of human beings uh, is part of the good for being a human being. I can see somebody shaking their head down here, and I, well, I, I, I'm dying to know why. I'm just wondering, because you could have different purposes, couldn't you? I mean, for instance, uh, in, in one stage in history, women might have been seen, their purpose might have been seen for childbearing, and that's all. Uh, but, you know, I think today we would, we would, well, exactly, but today we differ in that, wouldn't we? Okay, but, but actually, actually that's quite a useful question, because um, Aristotle believes that there is one purpose for each kind of thing. Um, so actually, no, he wouldn't agree that there are different purposes. Um, there is only one. Let's have a look at what that one might be, and I think that might... Because um, you're talking about actually the good for a woman as opposed to the good for a man, and that would be a different thing. Um, but we're talking here about the good for humankind, for human beings. OK, uh, the function of a kind, according to Aristotle, <laughs> is whatever it is that distinguishes normal, mature members of this kind from normal, mature members of other kinds. OK, so if we're looking at the function of humankind, we're looking for whatever distinguishes normal, mature human beings from other, from, from normal, mature members of other kinds. OK, what, what do you think this is? Let's have a go. What, what distinguishes us from any other kind, from chairs, from plants, from animals, from... Seeking rationality. Rationality, OK, what did you say? Seeking happiness. Uh, Language. Do you not think pigs seek happiness? In a, I mean... <laughs> Uh, OK, you're making a distinction between pleasure and happiness. OK, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So what Creativity. We... Creativity. Imagination. Yes, I wonder if creativity and rationality have something in common yeah. here. Yeah. Um, do you think? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. What do you mean by creativity? Then? could mean understanding what exists. Creativity is the ability to invent other things or imagine. OK, and wouldn't that link to rationality in that being, if you want to invent something, you presumably have in, in your mind the idea of what it is you want yes. to invent, yes. and so you have a problem, you devise a strategy by which to achieve that end, and then you implement the strategy, etc. So you, perhaps creativity yes. and rationality are, are, are not a million miles. Any other thought? Is it more like self-awareness that enables you to reflect on your own actions? Um, Self-awareness, that is an interesting one. I mean, again, there are suggestions that there are animals that are both rational, creative, and indeed self-aware. But let's have a look at self-awareness and the link between that and creativity and rationality. Um, if you're self-aware, you're aware of the beliefs you have, aren't you? Um, and being aware of your beliefs, you, you can also be aware of whether these beliefs are true or false. In fact, to be aware of a belief of yours is usually to know what it is for that belief to be true or false, isn't it? 
and therefore to be able to recognize when that belief is true or false. Um, and again, you're constructing a, a, a picture of the world of a lot of beliefs that again, you're looking, checking the consistency of. Um, so again, self-awareness seems to be a necessary condition of rationality, or is it that rationality is a necessary condition of self-awareness? They certainly seem to go together. An ethical view? Sorry? <clears throat> An ethical view. Um, okay, we might think that what distinguishes human beings from other animals is, is that they can be moral agents. Um, I mean, we certainly do think that we don't... Um, well, we used to hang dogs, didn't we, for stealing loaves of breads and things like that, but these days we don't do that. Because we don't think of animals as um, capable of moral agency. Yeah. But why is that? Do you remember we, we looked at um, free will last week? We looked at what it is to act intentionally. Do you remember? What, what is it to act intentionally? Can anyone remember? So if I intentionally trip over the carpet, I, I've got to have an end in mind, haven't I? And a belief that tripping over the carpet will attain that end. Again, we get a link with rationality. We get a link with having beliefs and being able to perceive rational relations between beliefs. Do you see what I mean? That, so rationality, to be rational, is to have beliefs and to see the rational relations between beliefs. Ah, if I believe P and I believe that if P then Q, I must also believe... Thank you. And if I believe um, P and Q and I believe not P, what do I... What am I forced to do? Uh, so I believe... If, uh, sorry, P and Q, and I believe, and then I form the belief not P. It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. So I'm going to have to drop one of those beliefs, aren't I? Because I'm presented, because I see the two beliefs are inconsistent, I, I am forced to see that I've got evidence for error. One or other of those beliefs has got to be wrong, and therefore rationally I'm forced to drop one or other, other of them. So ration, the idea of rationality, beliefs, truth and falsehood, um, having ends and having beliefs about how to achieve these ends, all of this is bound up in being rational, being creative, being self-aware, etc. And Aristotle thought that the only thing that distinguishes normal, mature human beings from normal members of other kinds is our capacity for reason. Yep. And, and you see, the other answers you gave are tied up in this. You didn't mention one thing that I'm surprised you didn't mention. Something that distinguishes human beings from all other animals. Language. Thank you, yes. It, it does seem to be a rather obvious one, doesn't it? Again, just as I said, there, are, there is some evidence that some animals are rational, creative, self-aware, etc. There's also some evidence perhaps that some animals have language dolphins people talk about elephants and um what's the other there's another one that people think have Whale, whales. whales yeah okay um but how do you think language and reason go together can anyone think of, of a way that you might think that you couldn't have language without having reason uh to have language um Yes, that's good. So a word like red is an expression of a concept of redness, isn't it? So there's redness, the property in the world. There's redness, our concept of redness. And then there's the word red, which expresses the concept, etc. So absolutely. So language and reason go together as well, because in using language, every time I assert a sentence, assert a sentence rather than using a sentence to question something, if I assert a sentence, what I'm doing is expressing a belief, aren't I? Um, so if I say the chair is blue, I'm express expressing a belief of mine that the chair is blue. Was that a question? I, I, I was going to say that I can't see how you can reason without language. I was going to put it the other way around. Mm. 
Um, lots of philosophers do think that you can't re without language you can't reason, and therefore actually that lang language and reasoning go together. So any animal who isn't capable of language in some way is also an animal that can't reason. Um, what about you mathematics? Without language? I mean, you, you, have you, can't, you can have a concept of numbers and manipulate them without, without resort, resort to, to language. Do you think you could have a concept of the number two? Yes. Ah, without language. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with you. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, perhaps I could leave that because I think that takes us... I think it's an interesting question. Perhaps we can talk about it later. OK, um, so our capacity for reason is what distinguishes it us from everyone else. And this, according to Aristotle, is a key to the purpose of the life of a human being. So um, the purpose of a human being, if Aristotle is right, is successfully to exercise reason. It's not just to exercise reason, because if you go around reasoning badly, um, you're not being a successful human being. But if you successfully exercise reason, um, then you are going to become a successful human being. You are fulfilling your human potential. And Aristotle would call it you're exercising the virtues. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so to be a successful human being is to be to reason successfully, to successfully exercise your capacity for reason. Um, there are two sorts of virtue, according to Aristotle. They're the virtues of the intellect, and there are the moral virtues or the virtues of character. So, in order to become uh, an excellent human being, you've got to exercise both of these. It's no good exercising one and not the other. And in fact, you'll, we'll see later on that Aristotle thought that if you have any virtue, you must have all the virtues. You can't have just, just one virtue. So let's, we'll, but we'll look at that later. Okay, two sorts of virtue. Intellectual virtues include knowledge, so you know things, good judgment, and practical wisdom. In other words, you, you um, in action, you exercise reason well. Um, and uh, the, the important thing about the intellectual virtues, according to Aristotle, is they can be taught. So if you have good parents, parents who, who themselves uh, exercise the intellectual virtues and they do their duty by you, and you have good teachers who do that, you can be taught how to acquire knowledge, how to exercise good judgment, how to be wise in practical matters, and so on. So all these things can be taught, which is great. Um, but when it comes to the virtues of character, or the moral virtues, which include, and only include, there are many more than this, courage, generosity, fair-mindedness, self-respect, etc. These can't be taught, according to Aristotle. All your parents can, do, well, uh, let me ask you, why, why can't they be taught? What can our parents teach us? Sorry, that, that was two questions, and that's very unfair. Let me start again. What can our parents teach us? How to live. <laughs> well, that's one answer. What, what do they teach us? What, what do you as parents teach children, young children here? I'm not talking about your grown-up children. <laughs> fairness. Try uh, to teach them fairness. But what do you say to them? You, you give them... Follow the example. example. OK, you, you provide them with examples, yes. OK, I'm looking for one word here, and I, I'm obviously not getting into getting this. This is a big problem for teachers. You think you're going to get the word immediately, and you don't. Rules. Rules, exactly. So that was the word I was looking for. That's what we give children, isn't it? And in our example, we try and live these rules. So if you want to teach your children to be fair, you, you try not to be um, unfair in front of them. Um, and you say to them when they do something that isn't fair, when they pinch somebody else's toys or something like that, you say, no, you've got to be fair. You give them rules. And Aristotle thinks that when you're doing that, um, you're helping them to get into a position where, where they will be able to acquire the virtues, but what you're not doing is teaching them to be moral. Why might you think that? Thinking back to the last two weeks, they have free will to accept this rule or not, or uh, just accept it because 
they have some consequences of this, but it's a, it's a free will. That, that's certainly one answer, because it's, it's certainly true that um, I, when young children do what their parents want them to do, you know, there's that time when all children do exactly what you want them to do, and isn't it wonderful? And, yeah. and then they grow up. <laughs> um, about five, I think. Um, and at that point, it's, it's whether they choose to accept your rule. Yes, OK, that, that's a good thing. Um, what was the question I asked? I'd forgotten. Why you cannot read? Oh, yeah, that's right. Why teaching rules isn't teaching morality? What's, what's the other problem you're going to hit as a parent? OK, so you never do anything unjust in front of your children initially, but then eventually you... We well, don't always follow your own rules. You don't follow your own rules. But so, also, also Daddy, you lied! <laughs> um, we've all had that, haven't we? And at that point... What are you going to say about what they should do to act morally? Because your, the rule that you've given them, that you've brought them up with, um, has proven to be actually not very useful. You yourself have broken it. And it may be that you've broken it when you obviously shouldn't have done. And in, in that case, it, it can be fairly easy. You can say, Daddy shouldn't have done that. It, you know, it was really bad. But on another occasion, it might be one of these dilemmas that we talked about in the first week where actually being dishonest seems preferable to being unkind or, or something of that kind. So the trouble with teaching children rules is you're not actually equipping them to engage in moral reasoning, are you? You're helping to put them in a position where they value the things that they'll have to reason about, things like fairness and honesty and what have you. But you're not actually giving, because in telling them to be kind and be honest, you're not giving them any clue how to deal with a situation where you can't be both kind and honest, as in the dilemma that we talked about. So Aristotle's problem here is that we, we actually can't teach the virtues of character. Every person must acquire them for themselves, partly because they've, they've got to get behind the rules that their parents, they can, they've got to see why honesty, fairness, etc., are important. And they've got to work out what honesty, fairness, etc., are and how, you know, what it is in a particular situation to be honest, fair, or whatever. But did he not believe that you're born with these? I mean, I got that from the, the Glyn Hughes squashed... Aristotle, the squashed version. Yeah, which, which I thought was brilliant. Yes. But I, I think he said... It's a lot easier than the... Well, yeah, I couldn't read the translation. It was just... OK. But, but I thought he said, Aristotle said, that some things you are born with, which sort of briefly sort of rose, raised a flag with me. So. Here you're saying yeah, they have to be acquired. You, you are not born with the moral virtues, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, actually, so, so I won't talk about it, it's just here, but it's absolutely true that you're not born with the moral virtues, nor can you be taught them. So somehow we each have to acquire the moral virtues for ourselves, the virtues of character for ourselves. OK, so no human being, according to Aristotle, can achieve life's purpose without exercising these virtues. If to be a successful human being is to exercise the capacity for reason, that is to acquire, both, acquire and exercise both the intellectual and the moral virtues, um, that's what we've got to do before we can achieve our potential. But if we do exercise the virtues in accordance with excellence, um, we'll be satisfying a condition necessary for the achievement of our purpose in life. And um, Aristotle calls our purpose in life what we're aiming to achieve, eudaimonia. OK, that's what we're all after. And this is usually translated happiness, but I'm going to say something about that in a moment. But what's in particular here, I just want to point out that if we acquire and exercise the virtues, and we do it very well, um, we won't necessarily end up um, with eudaimonia. We might still miss it, because we'll have satisfied a condition necessary for it, but unfortunately not sufficient. And the reason it's not sufficient is Aristotle says, and I think probably we'll agree with him here, um, you can be as virtuous as you like, but if your family's wiped out in an accident, um, or, or you lose all your money in, the, in a because some bank has stolen it. <laughs> um, you're not going to end up um, 
with eudaimonia. So you, you, you've satisfied a necessary condition, but, but it's not, sadly, a sufficient condition. You also need, Aristotle says, luck, um, and you need a certain amount of money. And we might pour scorn on that, but I think possibly we agree with that. A certain amount of money. Don't need to win the lottery, but enough to pay the bills. Um, eudaimonia is often translated as happiness, but we think of happiness, don't we, as a sort of men as a mental state. Okay, it's a state we can be in at a time. So it's true of me that either I'm happy or I'm not at a particular time. Is that not right? Okay, so that if we think of happiness as a, as a mental state, then it doesn't capture at all what Aristotle means by eudaimonia. Um, we achieve eudaimonia to Aristotle only if we live a successful life. So it's a life of, it, it, for a start, you can only achieve eudaimonia at the end of life. I mean, Aristotle says that we, we aren't, I, I'm going to sometimes use happy for eudaimonia because it just comes naturally. But if I do, please understand, I don't mean the mental state of happiness. Okay, Aristotle says we're, we're not happy till we're dead. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Erica thinks that's rubbish, but actually, if you understand what eudaimonia means, you can see that actually at this stage in our lives, we've still got projects that we're engaged in, aren't we? We still don't know whether our projects are going to come to fruition. Our children may be about to get into drugs and sex and rock and roll. Well, they're probably already into drugs, sex and rock and roll, but they may go down the wrong route and end up selling them or, or no. something like that. We don't know yet how our projects are going to turn out. If, if at the end of life, the projects that we've worked on, that we've, we've seen as our purpose in life, have worked out well, our marriages have been happy, our, our children have worked out well, our careers have been a success and so on, we can look back on our deathbeds and think, yeah. OK, now we've achieved eudaimonia. And, and what's more, it's, an, it's not just how we feel about our lives. You know, other people will look at our lives and think, yes, that was, that was a good life. This person has, has had a successful life. They've fulfilled their potential in life. So uh, eudaimonia is often um, translated as flourishing. And flourishing is somehow better, I think, than happiness, but it still doesn't quite capture the idea that this is, this is a property of a whole life. Mm -hmm. It's not the property of you now, it's the property of a whole lifetime. Would One, two, three, and then we're going on. Would contentment be a better translation? No, I don't think it would, because you could live a contented life, can't you, without living a successful one? I mean, if I... I sometimes think as I drink my wine in the evening and eat my um, pasta or something, this is, this is the life, I'm content. But, the, it, but if I were to do that every night... But, but for you, that could be a successful yes, life. Yes, you see. If that's what you want to achieve. I, I think, well, I d actually, something from John Stuart Mill is quite useful yeah. here. Um, if you think about a happy pig and an unhappy Socrates, Mill thinks that it would be better to be an unhappy Socrates than a happy pig, because the sort of pleasure that a pig can get, which I should imagine is something similar to what I'm getting when I have my wine and my pasta, um, is not enough for the happiness of a human being. Um, because a human being needs to have... I mean, these ends that we... Because the thing is, what a pig can't do, or at least it's not obvious a pig can do it, is to... to um, set itself a goal to formulate a strategy by which to achieve that goal and then to implement the strategy um, which might involve, for example, not acting on some of its desires. If I want to get into that ball gown at the end of two months and I'm going to have to not eat this cream cake, okay, so I suppress one of my desires in order to, to achieve another longer term desire. This is what human beings do. And it needn't necessarily be elitist. Um, it could be, you know, if you're a disabled child who wants to learn how to tie your shoelaces um, and you, by trial and error and by putting in a lot of effort and so on, you do it, then you are exercising the virtues in exactly the way you should do in order to achieve eudaimonia in the end. Are you with me? 
So it needn't be an elitist thing. It's just a thing that's characteristic of human beings, that we form goals, we formulate strategies by which to achieve goals, and then we exercise tenacity, self-discipline, etc., in order to implement those strategies. And, and when we do that and we achieve those goals, the, the happiness we feel is not available to a pig, is it? Or at least it seems yeah. unlikely. <laughs> So that's, that's um, I mean, I'm using actually Mill there. This is what Mill was talking about, not what Aristotle was talking about. But, but the idea is, if we can see what Aristotle means by exercising the virtues in this way, and see that if over a lifetime we do this, we formulate goals for ourselves, and we, and we exercise the virtues of character in achieving those goals, and, and that's going to mean not getting some of the things we want. So we, we set aside some things that we want in order to achieve things that we deem better. Um, then we are on our way to achieving eudaimonia. We're, we're on our way to having a successful life, to living a life in accordance with the reason that makes us human. I've said all this in the ones I'm going to use now. OK, so you're likely to be happy if you've achieved eudaimonia, but you can be happy without achieving eudaimonia. OK, you can be happy just because you got a Valentine's card this morning. <laughs> OK, um, I've said this already. So, so uh, successfully exercising the virtues is not a sufficient condition of achieving eudaimonia. If your family get wiped out in an accident, um, you're not going to achieve eudaimonia even if you have successfully exercised the virtues. And I've said this as well, so let's move on. So for Aristotle, a virtuous person, and do you remember we said um, um, virtue ethics says that the virtuous act, the right action, is the action that's performed or would be chosen by a virtuous person. So we're getting more of a feel now for what a virtuous person is. A virtuous person is a person who ex exercises the virtues, both intellectual and moral, in accordance with excellence, and they're on their way to achieving eudaimonia. Uh, and this helps us see why he also says that the right action in any given situ situation is that that would be chosen by a virtuous person. Let's have a closer look at this. A virtuous person is one who knows what's right, does what's right, and does it for the right reason. OK, let's have a look at this more closely. I want you to think back to our moral dilemma. OK, can anyone tell me the moral dilemma just so that it's in our minds? What was the moral dilemma which, which we started in week one? Do you remember? The choice between being kind OK, and what was the situation in which we had that choice? What do you think of my hair? <laughs> That's right. A friend of ours has been to the hairdresser. She comes back and she says, it might be a he, of course. Sorry, I realised that I was in danger of being sexist there. They come back from the hairdresser and they say, what do you think? And you think, yuck. OK, and the problem you've got is, should I be kind? Should I be honest? Um, OK, so the virtuous person in this situation um, would only need to be in the situation in order to see, and I've put see in, um, because obviously we don't mean seeing by perception, we mean see intellectually here. And, and of course, in, being in the situation, they would know all sorts of things that we don't know now, because we've just got a very abstract situation here. But um, imagine if, if this is the uh, first time you've seen your pal smile for six months. That pushes you in one direction, doesn't it? Um, or let's think of something that would push you in the other direction. Um, let's say that you know she's going to meet this hot date um, tonight that she's really hoping to impress, and, and you know that he's going to loathe this, or she. <laughs> OK, so um, each, the more you know about the situation, the more you're, you're able to see what the right thing is to do, is the thought of it. And anyway, the virtuous person would, in a situation, know what to do. That's what the thought is, anyway. And such a person, knowing which action is right, is always going to perform it. So we all, well, 
I do anyway, perhaps you don't, but we all know what it's like to believe that we should tell the truth in this situation and then find ourselves not telling the truth. Yeah. What, whatever the situation is in this case, the virtuous person knows what the right action is and would, knowing it, mm. always perform it. So if telling the truth is right in this situation, we're not saying it is, but if no. telling the truth is right in this situation, he would tell the truth. Mm. He wouldn't give in to moral cowardice. Now, I'm sure you've never done that, but, um, but no, 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 I can see you all shaking your head. But you know what it's like when you think, Bleh. well, no, you don't, okay, but I do. <laughs> you think, oh, I ought to tell the truth here, but if I do, I'm gonna get myself into trouble here, and you don't tell the truth. You put your own comfort, if you like, before doing the right thing. Well, virtuous person, people don't do this, okay? They, they do the right thing. And um, they also do the right thing for the right reason. If telling the truth is the right thing to do, they tell it because it's the right thing to do, not because they gave in to a moment's spite. OK? So you, you can imagine your friend comes in and says, what do you think? And, and you think, I really ought to tell them the truth. And actually, I'm dying to tell them the truth <laughs> after that thing she said to me last week. <laughs> you know, no, I don't think it looks nice at all. The virtuous person wouldn't do that because they would, do the, they would see what was right, they would do what was right, and they'd do it because it's right, not for any other reason. So if, um, if it's right to be kind, they would, do, they would be kind because being kind was the right thing to do rather than because they were giving in to moral cowardice. You with me? So, so doing something for the right reason is as important as, as actually doing the right thing. So to understand this is to see that exercising the virtues, uh, this is very important because um, if you think that the end in life is eudaimonia and the way to achieve this end is to exercise the virtues, you might think, okay, I really want eudaimonia, therefore I'm gonna exercise the virtues in order to achieve eudaimonia. Can you see that would be missing the point entirely? Um, because actually, if you're using, um, if you're being kind as a means to the goal of your own happiness, then what have you not done? Okay, you you've, may have done the right thing, but you haven't done it for the right reason. And the fact you haven't done it for the right reason means you're not virtuous, which means you're not going to get there anyway, are you? <laughs> so it's, a, it's pointless. Um, so you're completely missing the point if you see exercising the virtues as a means to the achievement of eudaimonia. Um, I want you to note that Aristotle is a realist about right and wrong, about moral action. He believes that there is an action that's right, but that we are only acting rightly if we perform that right action for the right reason. So he distinguishes a right action from a right, or a moral action, if you like, from a moral agent, a person who's acting morally. So the person, if in a situation uh, it's right to tell the truth, and you tell the truth, okay, you're performing the right action, but you may not yourself be acting virtuously. Because if you're telling the truth for the wrong reason, then you may be performing the right action, but you're doing it for the wrong reason, and you are not yourself to be praised for this. See, see again what I mean? So there's a difference between being the right action or performing the right action and actually being morally right yourself. Aristotle is presupposing, though, that you know what the right action is in all this argument. I mean, if you, if you well, he's not presupposing. He's, he's saying that you wouldn't be a virtuous person unless you knew. But if you take the the question of dropping the atomic bomb at the end of the Second World War. I don't know, even to this day, whether it was the right action or not. So what do we know about him? Ah. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sure there are some. But if you were in a situation where you actually had to make that decision, you would make that if you were a virtuous person. Actually, let me come to that at the end because do you remember I, talk, I said that we're going to talk about whether this is a, right, a good decision procedure at the end. So perhaps we'll, we'll come back to that question rather than answer it here. But for this virtual person, uh, dilemma doesn't exist at all. So they don't have this. 
Um, well, if a dilemma arises because there are two, two rules that clash in a situation, I mean, we're all brought up with rules. We all use moral rules, whether they're moral absolutes or rules of thumb is a different thing entirely. But a dilemma happens when you've got two rules, both of which you want to obey and you can't. That sets up a, a, a dilemma. I don't, I don't see why. I would be kind or I would be honest and it would be right because it would act for the right but, but if I were somebody who was uh, exercising mathematical virtues, it wouldn't mean that a mathematical conundrum wasn't a conundrum for me. It would mean that I would approach it and in the hope of solving it and I would succeed if I was exercising excellence in mathematical. So, so I, I, still, I don't see that a dilemma wouldn't be a dilemma initially, it, but it's a question of how the virtuous person would approach the dilemma. I mean, he wouldn't just go into this dilemma. Do you remember in the first week I said, one way you can respond to that sort of dilemma is to make yourself new rules. Every time honesty and um, kindness come into conflict, I'm going to be honest. Do you remember? And I said, do you know anyone like that? And you all went, yes. And, and sometimes you might say, if kindness and honesty come into conflict, I'm always going to be kind. And we all know people like that too, don't we? So the virtuous person would go into a dilemma, see the dilemma, and he wouldn't respond thus. Um, OK, he wouldn't make himself more rules that, that are going to lead him into. So I, I don't think I agree that it wouldn't be a dilemma, just that he would be better equipped to, to solve it. Um. <clears throat> Do you think um, Aristotle um, overplays reason? For instance... Um, uh, well, I actually, can, um, yeah, sure. can I stop you there and, and put that question to the end? Because that's quite a major one. And also, <laughs> we'll be looking at that over the next couple of weeks as well. But, you, but it's, it's absolutely true that reason is com absolutely right. central to Aristotle's moral theory. Next week, we're going to look at a theory which takes reason right out of the center stage. So, so I'd like to answer your question next week, if, that, if that's all right. OK, so there is an action that's right, but we are only right if we perform that action for the right reason. We can perform the right action and not be acting morally. Um, da -da, da -da. Uh, OK, we saw earlier that Aristotle believes that the, the, we've got to acquire the virtues of character because they can't be taught to us. Um, he rejects the idea that we know moral truth by knowing rules. He absolutely believes, and this is you're again going to think he puts reason right at the centre, the rules, he says, run out. You can only become a moral agent by learning how to exercise moral reasoning. In each situation that you come to, you've got to exercise moral reasoning right from the beginning. Rules will not help you, or rather they'll help you, but only up to a certain point. They won't take you any further. Um, OK, so let's look at how we acquire these virtues of character. Now we're all interested in acquiring them though not, of course, in order to achieve eudaimonia, because that would be defeating the purpose. <laughs> OK, to acquire the virtue of courage, um, one of the first things we've got to do is reflect on the nature of courage. OK, just, just before I go on to the other bits there, do you remember I said that whenever you're hit with a dilemma, whenever you're forced into a position where you think, oh, I can't be both kind and honest, what am I going to do? You've got to think, well, what is it to be kind? Do I sometimes have to be cruel to be kind, for example? What about lying? Is telling a white lie the same as a black lie sort of thing? So you're reflecting on the nature of truth. What is truth? What is kindness? And Aristotle thinks that uh, as a virtuous person, that's one of the first things you're going to do, because you can't possibly know what the right action is in a situation unless you know what it is to have courage, to be kind, etc. So um, what we're going to understand is that the courageous person is going to avoid vi vices of both rash rashness and cowardice. OK, the um, right action is the golden mean. You'll have heard this used in connection with Aristotle. So here's rashness. This is the person who 
never feels fear. He doesn't really need courage. He just goes out there and, and gets himself, you know, he sees somebody beating somebody up in the street and he goes straight in and pulls them apart and doesn't even think about what might happen to him. OK, is that courage or, or is that rashness? And then there's the other person who sees what's happening and skulks around the corner and thinks, I probably should intervene here, but I'm not going to. Um, to be courageous, you've got to go somewhere in between those two things. You don't want to be rash. You don't want to be cowardly. You want to have just the right amount of courage. Um, and for each of us, that might involve something different. So um, maybe Joan is um, a very rash person, OK? And John uh, tends to cowardice. Sorry. OK, so when you're thinking about how to be courageous, you've got to take into account where you're coming from. So if you know of yourself that you have a tendency to, to be rash, then you've got to guard against that rash aspect of your character in order to achieve the golden mean. And if you know that you have a tendency to cowardice, you, you know that you've got to fight against that to achieve the golden mean. So the... Um, in order to acquire the virtue of courage, or indeed any other um, virtue, um, you've got to know the virtue itself, what courage is, what the two vices are that it's in between, and you've also got to know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you're not going to acquire the virtues. Um, so to acquire the virtue of courage, you've also got to get into the habit of acting courageously. Um, I mean, actually, this, this is, it's quite good with a lie. We all, well, again, I keep saying we all know, but perhaps you don't. I've got to give you that. Um, the first lie is, is quite difficult. Second one's a bit easier. Third one's even easier. Um, the next thing you know, actually, lying is second to nature. Um, we can get into the habit of being dishonest. And what we've got to do if we want to acquire the virtues is to get into the habit of being honest. So this is why Aristotle says you're not born with a virtue. You may be born with a tendency to be courageous um, or a tendency to be honest, but it, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the virtue of courage. Somebody who might, who's born strong, born with the potential for being an athlete, um, is not necessarily going to become an athlete, are they? Because if they grow up lazy and fat, they don't eat the right things, they don't exercise, they don't look after themselves. They don't actually fulfill the potential with which they were born, do they? They don't become athletic because they've allowed themselves to become flabby and lazy. And in the same way, uh, we can get morally flabby. So the, the thing about having a tendency to be um, honest, let's say, is that if you're doing it just from instinct, there's no real guarantee you're going to do it when it becomes difficult to do it. Do you see what I mean? If it becomes difficult to do it, you might think, well, OK, I'm not going to do it here. Whereas actually, if you've got the virtue of honesty, you will be honest even though it's difficult, even though all your instincts cry against not being honest here because it would further your ends in some way. You would still be honest because you've got yourself into the habit of honesty. Um, so getting the virtue of honesty uh, guarantees that you're going to be honest even when it goes against your inclinations, whereas simply having an instinct for honesty means that your inclination is to be honest, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be honest when you, it's against your inclinations. OK? So that's why. Does that answer your question, John, about was it? Was it you? I can't remember who it was. Who asked about being born virtuous? Well, it's not like I mentioned it. OK, yeah. that's the answer. That, that's why we're not born virtuous. We may be born... I mean, it's very nice to be born with a tendency... It's easier to acquire the virtue of honesty if we're born with a tendency to honest, honesty. But if, if all we have is a tendency, an instinct to be honest, that's not the virtue of honesty. Um, OK. Actually, I just want to say something else. Do you remember something I said the, um, during the first week? Um, the thing about an honest person 
um, is not simply that they're always telling the truth. OK, because a dishonest person has very good reason always to tell the truth, doesn't he? What is that reason? Because you can't lie to somebody unless they trust you. And to get them to trust you, you've got to tell them the truth most of the time. So a dishonest person has very good reason to be honest. Um, being on, telling the truth on most occasions doesn't make you an honest person. Because if you're dishonest, you're holding yourself ready to tell a lie as soon as it um, is good for you, sort of thing. So simply telling the truth doesn't distinguish an honest person from a dishonest person. The honest person is in the habit of telling the truth, tells the truth because it's the right thing to do, and so on, not because they want people to trust them. So, OK, to have the virtue of courage is to understand the nature of courage. It's to be consistently courageous and always to be courageous for the right reason. No pressure there, then. Um, Aristotle says two things about virtue that we might find odd. Um, he thinks that the virtues are unified, that you can't have one without having them all. OK, so you can't be um, courageous without being honest um, and kind. Why do you think he might say that? I mean, isn't it obviously wrong? Can't you have a, a courageous burglar? Yes, oh, yes. Well, Erica thinks you can. OK, well, <laughs> what do the rest of you think? Daring, you know, enterprising. Mm. <laughs> hey, I mean, a cat burglars have got to have some courage, don't they, to, really? to climb up. And, um, In fact, I mean, they take to burglary simply because it's more exciting. <laughs> OK. But they'd be exercising courage for the wrong reason. Uh, OK, they'd be exercising... Yes, they wouldn't be performing the courageous act because it's the courageous thing to do. That's certainly yeah. true. Yeah. OK, any, any other thought on that? Could a burglar be courageous? Burglar be what? Courageous. Yes, because as I say, it's burglar, doubtful, you know, dangerous places. What were you going to say? It's a soldier, wouldn't that be a better example? Uh, <laughs> what, could a soldier be courageous? Well, yes, but he, he might also be immoral, he might be dishonest as well. He might be he he might, but what, what we're looking at is, is whether it's possible to have one of the virtues without having the other. And I'm using a burglar because a burglar, by definition, is dishonest. And therefore, Aristotle would have to say he can't be courageous. And, and so it looks as if a courageous burglar is a, is a counterexample to Aristotle. Are you with me? Yes. Did I, did I misunderstand yeah. your point? Yeah. No, OK. But if the burglar, while carrying out the burglary, noticed that the house was on fire and carried the householder out through the flames <laughs> and saved their life, then they might have achieved virtue. OK, OK. Do, do we think we've got a courageous burglar, though, when he... he... No, because he wouldn't be a burglar then. He'd be changed from being a burglar to being a rescuer. Oh, no, well, <laughs> no, I don't think it quite works like that. He'd be a burglar and a rescuer. Or a rescuer and a burglar, wouldn't he? Well, let, OK, let me ask you, do, do you think someone who chooses to um, make a living by burglary is somebody who is manifesting courage in life? No. Or, or is there something immediately lacking in courage um, in deciding to become a burglar? We don't know. You said that we have to know. Well, we don't know why someone's become a burglar. It may be to feed a family of... But actually, can I stop you right there? Because um, it's the virtuous person who must know what the virtuous act is, not we who must know somebody else's motive. Um, so, so that bit of we don't know there doesn't... Well, OK, let, let's say that he needs to feed a family of 15, OK, and he chooses to do so by engaging in burglary. OK, is, is that the... Is that the correct... OK, well, do we think so? Is being courageous a, a selfless act and the burglar is not being selfless? Um, actually, that puts us into another thought about the universe. Can you be courageous and selfish? Because that would imply that if you can't, 
Sorry, what would it imply? I've lost, lost my train of thought there. But I'm sure you can work it out. That would mean you can't have all the... OK, so if you can be selfish and courageous, then Aristotle would again be wrong. So is it essentially um, self, selfish to become a burglar? Am I asking the right question there? I, I seem to have suddenly gone vague. I think the question is, is it dishonest? Well, it's certainly dishonest to be a burglar, but, but the, the question we're asking, can dishonesty and courage go together? Can uh, dishonest, well, courage and selfishness go together? Aristotle would say not, because he says if you have one virtue, you have all of the virtues. And I do think that if you look carefully at what it is to have each virtue, to do the right thing, to do the right thing for the right reason, and to do the right thing as a habit, it does look as if actually, I, I reckon, I feel, but, but obviously there are disagreements here, that actually choosing burglary as a career is not a very courageous act. Um, and if you think that, you'll, you'll think that, OK, you can't be a courageous burglar. doesn't mean that there are not all sorts of other problems with Aristotle's um, idea that the virtues are unified, but, but that one perhaps there is an answer to. But OK, going back to what you're saying, you're saying that somebody who, um, OK, they need to feed their family. Um, the only way they can do it is by stealing. Um, it's sometimes the courageous thing to do to steal. Yeah. We can imagine, I think, a situation of that kind. Um, but then maybe it's the... I was going to say, is it dishonesty at that point? So in wartime, um, for instance, if you're committing a burglary... Yes, I immediately thought of wartime. Or yes. Then you, know, you may be going against some sort of law, but actually it might be the honest thing to do in, in that. Or at least it might not be the dishonest thing to do, yeah. um, rather than, yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it, to think about these things, to, th to think about the situation where we're looking at what courage is and whether being a burglar is consistent with having courage, where you're not thinking about one courageous act, you're talking about having the virtue of courage. Um, so it does make it a very different question, and it forces you to see things much more in the rounds than you might otherwise do. I'm a bit concerned that there's almost a moral standard which is floating along out of focus, and it's come right from the beginning. Out of focus? Are you accusing me of being out of focus? No, 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 okay, no, go on. In Aristotle, of course. Oh, Aristotle, not me. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, your account starts with to successfully exercise reason. It goes on good judgment. So there are qualifiers built into the argument. But, but it, you said that Aristotle was a moral realist, that he thought there was a right thing to do. And I just wonder whether this right thing to do isn't somehow there without being quite explicit. Well, no, I, I think you, uh, I'll defend Aristotle on this because don't forget we're, where we're, go we're coming from here is that there is a final purpose. Human beings have a final purpose in life, a final cause, what, something that makes us a good human being. So the final purpose and the good of a human being or a good human being are, are inextricably linked because what makes a human being good is that he achieves the final purpose. And achieving the final purpose is what makes a human being good. And if, in order to achieve that final purpose, we've got to, the th we've got to fulfill our function, which is to exercise the virtues, it's no good exercising the virtues badly, because that's not going to achieve our end. We've got to achieve the virtues excellently, because that will achieve the end. Do you see what I mean? I, I, I don't think he can be accused of arguing in a circular here. Circle here. Is another qualifier. Well, I know it is, but, but why is there a problem so with... how do we know what's excellent? We don't. We have to exercise our own reason um, as best we can in difficult circumstances. I think maybe this does what, are you, what are you wanting to have here? A rule, well, or a, do you want something? Do you want me to say, okay, and exercising the virtues excellently, 
is doing this, 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 this. In other words, I'm going to give you a, a manual, uh, um, uh, one of those things you put under your computer to stop it, give you a manual on how to act morally. Aristotle says you can't do that. The only way you can act morally is, is to exercise reason in each particular case. And the only way you'll do it well is by acquiring these virtues. Aristotle's very unforgiving, though, isn't he? You've already well, actually, it's virtuous to be forgiving, so no, I don't think. If, if we're assuming that Aristotle is, is himself virtuous, he would... one virtue he doesn't have. But you, you don't get the impression from Aristotle, try, fail, try again, fail better. You know, you don't get... <laughs> no, that, that's so unfair. <laughs> no, don't forget that what we're doing here is, is we're trying to give you a, um, a procedure to follow by which to acquire virtue. I mean, what Aristotle is saying is if you do all these things, you will acquire virtue uh, and you will all things being equal, if you're lucky and so on, achieve eudaimonia. Uh, he's, he's not saying, you know, you're going to do it first time. He says it has to be acquired. You have to get into habits. If, if, and unfortunately, if your parents didn't help you, if your teachers didn't help you, it's going to be more difficult for you. So, so there's a very... It would be a completely different thing to, to then... If I were going to say to you... Oh, sorry, let me start again. I could do two things. One is I could tell you what Aristotle says that you should do to acquire virtue. The other thing is I could um, adopt with you the uh, situation of coach, where I'm actually trying to encourage you through the acquisition of a virtue. Now, I think if I'm doing the latter, I'm going to be saying, come on, I've forgotten your name. Julia. Come on, Julia. You know, Judith. Uh, Judith, sorry, Judith, you... you you know, I, I heard you tell that lie then. <laughs> Why did you do that? And you'll say, well, I didn't quite have the courage to... And I'll say, OK, well, look, let's put that behind you. You've got to acquire the habit of virtue. So do you see that coaching would be a completely different thing from writing down what it is you need? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't think we need to say that Aristotle... Because I do think forgiveness is also a virtue, and therefore, if he were unforgiving, he would lack virtue himself. And of course, actually, none of this says that Aristotle was a virtuous person, does it? No. All he's doing is writing down what... I mean, it's difficult to think that he would not be a virtuous person if he can do this, but might be wrong. I mean, we know that Aristotle felt that he couldn't be... Virtuous, you couldn't be a virtuous person if you were a woman or a slave <laughs> or a child or whatever. I mean, did you basically have to be a sort of, you know, elderly philosopher to actually have to You had to be a, <laughs> an a Athenian. Um, you're right, he did think that women, wouldn't, women weren't rational um, in the way a man was and therefore couldn't acquire virtue or eudaimonia, etc. Um, but actually, I think that we can sort of say Aristotle was a creature of his time. I, I forgive him for that. I, I think that were he around today, he might change his mind. But anyway, he did definitely say that. And he also said that slaves weren't um, rational. Uh, and that slaves also couldn't achieve eudaimonia. But, of course, you might think that that is true. H how could you fulfil life's purpose if, if you weren't free to make your own choices? Um, it wouldn't be anything against the slave. But he did think... I mean, maybe that's also why he thought women couldn't acquire it, because they weren't free to make their own decisions. But, no, he, he did... Uh, and, actually, the... the group of people he thought satisfied the condition of, of being rational was a very, very much smaller group than we would apply it to. But, but I think we can take what he's saying about what rationality is and just know that we apply it rather more widely. What about um, the mentally impaired? Would he have included them? Um, you're asking me questions that I can't answer because that's an historical question. I don't know. But let me tell you what, what I would think if I were doing this. I mentioned earlier somebody tying a shoelace. You know, if, if a mentally impaired, impaired person is still capable of forming plans, forming strategies by which to achieve those plans and exercising the, the virtues of character in the implementation of those plans, then why not? 
I, I don't see why that isn't a, an exercise of reason, of virtue, in exactly the same way it would be for you, just at a lower level, because there isn't the capacity there. I'm just uh, being judgmental about you know, worthy plans, if, if your plan is just to have a new colour I didn't mention mobile worthy. phone, you know, and you work towards that end, and then there's another colour for another mobile phone, do we still ah, consider? This is, this is a very good question, because actually the worthiness of ends and the worthiness of means by which to achieve your ends, when we talk about Kant, we'll talk about the difference between those th two things, because actually if all your ends are unworthy, but you achieve those, you, you formulate strategies by which to achieve those ends and you exercise the virtues in implementing those strategies. Are you a virtuous person? Surely you wouldn't be. There must surely be something about the, the um, choosing the right goals. Mm. So if you decide to be a burglar, you've got a problem immediately, haven't you? Um, because you, this is not a worthy goal. I mean, the person who steals because their children are starving, this is not a person whose end in life is to become the best burglar he possibly can, is it? So, so there would be a difference. So perhaps, actually, we're coming back to your claim about the, the person stealing because he had children in, in a different way, because his, his end would be completely different. But these are really interesting questions, aren't they? Um, I mean, if uh, I'm no... Uh, Aristotle scholar. Um, I, I like to think about what he says, but when you ask me specific questions about what he says, I'm going to send you to, to the reading list and you can find out for yourself what he says. Okay, um, the other th another thing he says is that possession of a virtue means that you're not even tempted not to do the virtuous thing. This is an interesting question as well. Um, Imagine two Mother Teresas. OK, there's one Mother Teresa. I'm going to have to change this example because nobody under 20 has heard of Mother Teresa. Um, there's one Mother Teresa who, who's always wanted to dance in red silk and go to nightclubs and have everyone, everyone tell her she's beautiful and so on. Uh, and she thinks, no, this isn't right. I'd really like to do this, but this is not what I should do. Um, I'm going to look after the poor. And then there's another Mother Teresa who's n not even tempted by the red silk, looks at the red silk and it, she's just oblivious to it. All she wants to do is look after the poor. Which Mother Teresa is more virtuous? The one who resisted temptation. Okay, you think it's the one. Yes. So you think it's more virtuous to be yes. tempted and yes. to resist yes. it yes. rather yes. than to yes. not yes. be yes. tempted in... Rather than not to be temp tempted in the first place. Um, how, how do people feel about that? Is Aristotle right about that? Straw poll. Is he right it's better not to be tempted at all? Uh, okay, you think, you think... Uh, Oscar Wilde says, uh, he's got a nice little <laughs> yes. he says, uh, I can resist everything but temptation. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to come out with the other, the other one, which was, um, no, it was May, May West or somebody said... Um, mm. Oh, what did she say? Come on, help me. <laughs> no one can remember. It's something to do with uh, of two temptations. I would, no, I, no, I can't remember. Sorry, I'll see if I can look it up for next week. But OK, who thinks that Aristotle is right, that it's more virtuous not to be tempted than to be tempted and to overcome temptation? OK, quite, quite a few of you. Are, OK, and who thinks the opposite? Oh, right, OK. So Aristotle's wrong, in your yeah, opinion. Right. OK, but now think about this in terms of what temptation is. Mm. OK, so temptation is when you see the right thing to do, but you have reasons, personal reasons, to do something other than whatever the right thing is. So you can see that you should be honest here, but you can also see that being honest is going to get you into trouble, so you're tempted not to be honest. Um, OK, now that's at a time. OK, but remember, the, the honest person, according to Aristotle, the person with the virtue of honesty, is someone who's formed the habit of, of being honest, even when inclinations are, are moving him in a different direction. Um, so a situation when he's actually acquired the virtue, and of course this is taking time, 
we don't know. I mean, I dare say one has to be at least 50 in order to have acquired the virtues. Um, you might then not be tempted. And, and you could see why you wouldn't be tempted, because it would just, it's no longer part of your character to, to even think that you would get away with something. Sorry, that you would rather be dishonest in order to get away with something than you would to be honest. Do you see again how the longevity of it, the, the fact that you're, it's a habit you're getting yourself into over a lifetime of being honest, temptation would tend to just slough off. So if but if, you, if you're on this sort of um, cycle of virtuosity, this um, automatic pilot... She doesn't like Aristotle, does she? Um, <laughs> then, then you it's see not see an automatic see. pilot. You're using your reason the whole it's time. Pilot, oh, no, it's not. You you're, you're no longer have to think. Then you cease to be... Sorry, when do you no longer have to think? You don't have to think about being virtuous. It's a habit. Um, so you, you're negating the, I see what you mean, hum that, the humanity of being a rational human being, which will, would mean that you're always aware of different possibilities. You know, I don't mm. like this, the thought of, of being on this automatic pilot, mm. um, because that, that somehow denies you your mm. humanity, which is that you're, mm. you're, you're, uh, you have to. To be, to be a, a, a human being, you have to be rational and reasoning. Well, and you have to exercise reason, and, and ex actively exercise yes, reason. Yes, and if yeah. you're on automatic pilot with all decisions made, um, then you, you've negated that. OK, I can see what you mean. And quite a few other people are, are nodding here. Um, the idea of being an, an automatic pilot would be very um, foreign to Aristotle. But I can see where you're coming from, the habit. He does definitely say you have to get into the habit, and then, having got into the habit, you're not tempted. That definitely does make it sound like automatic pilot, doesn't it? But on the other hand, he says you've got to do the right thing for the right reason. So reason is never very far away from Aristotle. Whenever you act, you act for reasons. You act to achieve a purpose. And the reason for which you're acting is you, you are doing the honest thing because it is the honest thing to do. That's, so reason doesn't fall away. But I, I do see what you mean about... I was going to say, it must be a tremendous struggle to, to, I mean, well, it is a tremendous struggle to reach the stage anyway, and the struggle must continue. I don't see it, you, you, you've reached it and then the struggle no longer, no longer happens. It's a struggle to reach this, this point anyway, this, this virtuous stage. Presumably there'd be some sort of payback. Um, sure, I mean, you mustn't be doing it for the payback, but as, as you acquire virtue, you would also be um, acquiring a reputation um, you would be acquiring self-respect. Yeah. Um, you'd be acquiring all sorts of good things that, OK, you're not doing it in order to achieve those good things, but willy-nilly, those good things would come. And actually, it's a very nice feeling, as we all know, of course, being over 50, some, some of us, um, that actually acquiring a good reputation is a nice thing to have. Acquiring self-respect is, is a good thing to have. Um, and both those things come with having, on the whole, chosen the right virtues, be valuing the right things, and, on the whole, living up to your values. I mean, what, what happens when we don't live up to our values? I mean, if, so you value truth, therefore you believe you should tell the truth, but you don't tell the truth, OK? What's going to happen? You're going to feel guilty. guilty. You're going to feel ashamed. You're going to... Okay, and that of course takes away from your self-respect, doesn't it? Or it can do something else. Because another thing we do sometimes when we don't live up to our values is start thinking truth. Why should I be bothered about truth? We actually become cynical. Um, so either we, we hate ourselves, we lose self-respect because we're not living up to things we value, or in order to get some simulacrum of self-respect, we trash the values that we previously held. Love, what's love? Truth, what's truth? And we become cynics. 
instead. So, so actually, living up, having the right values and living up to them, generally speaking, um, brings good, doesn't it? Rather than just making us sort of rule-bound, what was the word you used? Automatic pilots. Let's carry on. OK, Aristotle believes that our characters are in our own hands. We choose to become or not to become virtuous. So Aristotle very definitely believes in free will. And he doesn't think that our characters are set, that we're born as the people we are. Aristotle believes, very importantly, that there are two things. For a human being, there are two things. There are where we are and where we ought to be or where we believe we ought to be. And to get from one to the other, we exercise the virtues. So we know that we're given to cowardice, and we want to become courageous, and we know that in order to become courageous from our position of tendency to cowardice, we've got to do this, 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 and this. So you're using the intellectual virtues in, in setting out your strategy, and then you're using the virtues of character in order to get to your goal. Uh, but he thinks that you're doing that by your own free will. You can become morally flabby if you choose, if you decide to take the easy option instead of uh, exercising tenacity or whatever. Um, and if you become, at 50, let's say, you don't know what courage is, you don't act courageously, um, and you don't see courage as a reason, the fact that something's courageous as a reason to do something, you're actually culpable. Do you see what I mean? It's not that you have um, somehow, sadly, you've been brought up, even if you have been brought up badly, you have been offered enough opportunities in your life to acquire the, no, the um, no. virtues of courage. OK, Erica disagrees with that, and I'm sure many other people do. But Aristotle believes that our characters are in our own hands. If we make the right decision at each decision point, we will acquire virtue. If we make the wrong decision at each decision point, we won't. So we don't get there in a minute. It takes us a long time to get there, but we will where we get to is a function of the choices that we make on the route. It's not anyone else's fault if we become morally flabby. It's our own fault. Oh, you're all going to go away, aren't you, thinking, oh, I've got to... <laughs> right. Um, so let's look at the claim that Aristotle's ethics doesn't generate a decision procedure, that it doesn't tell us how to act. All it says is that the right action is the action that would be performed by the virtuous person. What is Aristotle actually telling us here? To exercise judgment. That we've got to go away and become virtuous people, haven't we? Um, and once we do, we, we will ourselves know what the virtuous act is. But of course, we've got to acquire this. This is, this is not going to come easily. Um, his only advice to us before or when we're on the way to acquiring our virtues is that if we want to know how to act, we should look to the actions of a virtuous person. OK, but that's actually what we all do, isn't it? Yes. Isn't this what you do whenever you've, you have in your own life a bit of a moral dilemma? You're not sure how to act. You could do this, you could do that, and you can see the arguments for both. You're not sure which one you should do. And we're talking moral here rather than prudence or something. Um, I bet all of us yeah. would go and seek the advice of someone whose advice we respect. So we may be wrong. <laughs> we may think they're virtuous and they're not. But we, we seek the advice of somebody we respect. And... Um, to the extent we do that, we're actually we're acting on exactly what Aristotle would say. And even the government does this. I mean, faced with a controversial issue, um, let's say whether um, embryos have the moral status of human beings or whether we should engage in therapeutic cloning or something like that, what does it do? It sets up a committee of the great and good and it appoints a philosopher, of course, um, to, to chair it. It says to Mary Warnock, OK, ask all these virtuous people what they think, and then together come to a series of recommendations, and that will be the right action. 
that'll be what, what we should do. So even the government goes in for a, a rather Aristotelian decision procedure when faced with a dilemma, when faced with a con controversial um, issue. Um, but, of course, we're looking to these exemplars. Where every time we do ask for the advice of somebody we respect, what we've got to do is not take that advice just unthinkingly. We don't just do. I mean, actually, have you ever given advice to somebody who's then gone off and acted on your advice and then turned around and blamed you for it <laughs> because it didn't go well? And they've got that wrong, haven't they? Yes. Because what should you do when somebody gives you advice? Go and think about it. Go and think about it. Put it into your decision procedure as, as a bit of advice, but then make, you have to make your own decision. And when you act, it's your responsibility for what you choose to do. It's not theirs. If they, I mean, they didn't. If they told you to go and jump over a cliff, would you do so? Right. So Aristotle believes that moral beliefs are true or false. OK, so if we go back to our first session, it, are moral statements true or false? He thinks yes. Therefore, he thinks there are moral facts. OK, there's something that makes moral beliefs true or false. He doesn't, on the other hand, think that there are moral rules. Or rather, of course, he accepts there are moral rules, but he doesn't think that that's where morality lies, that to be a moral agent, what you've got to do is find out what the right rules are and follow them. He doesn't think there is a manual for, for being moral. Um, he, he thinks we can acquire moral knowledge. OK, so do you remember in the second uh, week we looked at whether there is such a thing as moral knowledge, what it is to acquire moral knowledge. Um, and Aristotle has us, he thinks that the virtuous person in a situation will somehow see what the right thing to do is. Um, his capacity for reason will enable him to reason to what the right action will be. And finally, he thinks we're free to choose our actions. And you might just ask yourself, and of course, these are not words that meant anything to Aristotle. You know, he said, if he'd said to Aristotle, are you a token absolutist, he would have said, eh? <laughs> um, and we might, how does he actually explain what it is that a virtuous person is doing when in a situation they see what it is to act morally. So lots of questions still about Aristotle. And there may be all sorts of things you, you disagree with about Aristotle. But all we need you to do is, is feel that you've got some grip on what his theory was. And here, as usual, are a list of questions for you to think about if you want to think about Aristotle. Um, so what is the golden mean? Why does Aristotle think it's important? OK, I did talk about that, but you might need to go away and think a bit about that. But that question will get you thinking about that bit of it. So these questions are just there to stimulate your own reflection. And finally, here's the reading for next week.